And now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Um, Vicki Hardy is a fourth year graduate student at LASP working under Dr. Phil Chamberlain uh, to, build sounding rock, to build a sounding rocket payload to observe the sun. Uh, the team plans to launch in the spring of next year from the Poker Flat Research Range in Alaska. Uh, upon completion of her degree, Vicki hopes to work in industry, helping to manage and build small to medium satellite projects. In her free time, she enjoys snowboarding, backpacking, painting miniatures, and playing Magic the Gathering. Let's all give a nice warm welcome to Vicki. Hi folks. So uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's exciting to actually get to practice speaking and, and actually do some public speaking. So uh, the subject I wanted to cover this the, today is uh, what do you mean the sun is hairy? Uh, exploring solar spicules, what they are and how we find them. So I'm a bet that most of you didn't realize that the sun has hair. Well, kind of. Uh, I guess I should first go over the overview. Uh, so first off, we're going to I'm going to talk about what do you mean the sun is hairy and why do I say this? Uh, we're going to talk about then why is this important to us? Why do we care? Uh, we're then going to move on to what we don't understand about the sun. And uh, there's plenty of things that we could discuss, but today I'm going to focus on what are these features that we're looking at? Uh, what exactly is going on in the chromosphere, which is a layer of the sun's atmosphere? And why is the solar corona so dang hot? Uh, then finally, I'm going to end with a brief shout out for my PhD research. So, what do you mean the sun is hairy? Uh, well, if you look at this, uh, if you look at this slide, you'll see that in the image there seem to be some sort of hairs or growths coming out of the surface of the sun. Uh, these are not, in fact, hairs, as you probably surmised. Uh, these are called spicules, uh, pronounced spicule, uh, and they are tiny, hot tubes of plasma. Uh, and they were first spotted on the limb of the sun. Uh, the limb is the edge of the sun. So why is this important to us? Well, we'd, uh, we'd definitely like to, under, uh, we'd like to understand the sun better. Uh, on a practical measure, understanding the sun better will help, us, uh, help protect us from solar storms. Uh, we can also, by understanding it better, increase our general knowledge of physics. And the sun is just pretty cool like hot, but also pretty cool. So there are a number of things that we don't understand about the sun, uh, including why is the solar corona so hot? Because it is extremely hot and we don't understand why. Uh, also, what exactly is going on in the chromosphere? Uh, this can be a fairly difficult uh, layer of the atmosphere to actually measure. And so, being able to study it uh, where spicules happen is a, a good and useful thing to be able to understand. And finally, the subject of this, what are those hairy features? So going backwards, we're going to start, actually, first off, we're going to start with the sun's atmosphere. Uh, this is just a brief refresher from uh, what you might've learned in high school. Uh, so the sun's refresher starts with, uh, sorry, the sun's atmosphere, uh, just above the solar surface, uh, starts with the photosphere. This is the surface of visible light. If you take a telescope and you put a filter on it and you look at the sun, you are looking at the photosphere. Then just above the photosphere, we have the chromosphere. This is the sun's lower atmosphere, and this is where spicules are found. Uh, just above the chromosphere, we have the transition region. Uh, this layer is only a few kilometers thick, which when you can cons uh, consider how massive the sun is, anything that's only a few kilometers is minuscule, absolutely tiny. But the crazy thing about this is the temperature goes from about 40,000 Fahrenheit at the bottom of uh, this region to over 1,800,000 Fahrenheit. This is an insane temperature jump over an insanely tiny space. And then finally, we get to the corona. The corona is, if you, uh, if you got, were lucky enough to see one of the solar eclipses recently, uh, that is, um, during the solar eclipse, you could actually see part of the corona and you could see the streamers coming out from it uh, at that point when it was, it was fully covered by the moon. 
Uh, the corona is the sun's, most of the sun's atmosphere, and it is very, very hot and very energetic. But we don't know why. We know that it's hot. We know that there are things that feed energy into it, but we're not sure why it's that hot. So starting with the questions that we were looking at earlier, what are those hairy features? Well, they were first observed in 1871 by Father Angelo Secchi. Uh, he, is, he was a uh, priest and a scholar at the Roman College Observatory in Rome, also a teacher. Uh, he is the first person to create a daily record of what the sun looked like uh, every day through observations. Uh, he also was the first person who observed and published about these spike-like features on the sun. And you can see in this image, this is one of his drawings describing what he was looking at. Uh, much, uh, quite a bit later in the 60s and 70s, we developed a lot more ability to start studying the sun. Uh, one of the main uh, increases here is ground-based telescopes had vastly increased resolution capabilities. So not only could we start actually see them, uh, we can start recording images and video, which helped us measure them better. Uh, these measurements uh, came in the form of measuring their length, their width, uh, their height out from the surface of the sun, how long they last. Uh, we could see there's actually waves going through them. And so we could see how fast those, uh, those waves were traveling or how fast they were growing up from the surface. And we could also see how long they lasted. Uh, it was at this time that uh, they also est uh, guessed that um, these features were actually plasma, which was uh, constrained in small magnetic flux tubes. Uh, they didn't have a great method to verify this, but that was the, the leading theory at the time. Uh, they also guessed that these features were very likely on the surface of the sun, also called, or on the disk of the sun, which is the center, as opposed to the limb. Uh, but they didn't know how to see them at the time. Then uh, in the 1980s and 1990s, uh, we had some more um, leaps in telescope technology, uh, particularly spacecraft. Uh, once we could start launching spacecraft uh, above the atmosphere, we could begin to uh, observe wavelengths that the atmosphere normally uh, absorbs. Uh, so this is usually X-ray, ultraviolet, EUV, uh, extreme ultraviolet um, wavelengths. And the sun behaves very differently in those wavelengths than it does in visible. So we were able to study the sun in completely new ways once we were able to launch things above the atmosphere. Uh, additionally, uh, developing computer models advanced from one dimensional simulations. Uh, uh, they, they started working on one dimensional simulations and started, I think the 1D, 1D simulations were started in the 70s. Uh, but they were greatly improved in the 80s and 90s. And uh, at this point, they were starting to spe uh, speculate on what the source of these features are. Why are they happening? Where is their energy coming from? And so they estimated that their energy source was probably from shock waves coming from below, uh, below the chromosphere up from the photosphere. Now we get to the 2000s and the present. Uh, again, we've had some amazing leaps in satellite technology. Uh, these new satellites have allowed for better observations in UV and EUV wavelengths. Uh, and bigger ground-based telescopes allow for much, much higher resolution. Uh, in addition, spectral observations proliferated. Uh, if we can view the spectrum of something, we can tell a lot more about exactly what that plasma is doing and where it's moving. Uh, it was during this time that spicules were first identified on the solar disk as dark models and dynamic fibrils. Uh, also, uh, other names for things that were eventually identified as spicules were rapid redshift and rapid blue shift excursions, RBEs and RREs. Uh, since things on, the, um, things on the limb were looking at the side versus things on the disk were looking at face on, it can be kind of difficult to identify features and link them together. Additionally, modeling has improved. Uh, we can now do some very, very, uh, we can now do some 3D modeling with very strict assumptions. Uh, 
but we're uh, a lot of that is is getting much better as well. And additionally, during this time, uh, it was we've found out that spicules actually occur in two different types: type one and type two. Uh, type one are slow moving ones, and type two are fast moving. And we'll cover that a little bit later. So finally, what are spicules? Uh, this is a diagram that kind of shows a little bit of a, a cartoon of what they might look like. Uh, so they are small magnetic tubes that contain plasma uh, at their most basic. Uh, those magnetic tubes are have a foot somewhere in the uh, photosphere uh, and then arch over and have a foot somewhere else. And at some point in that tube, there's hot plasma that we're looking at. Uh, we have identified that there are two different types of spicules, uh, possibly because there are two different sources or triggers, we believe. Uh, type 1 was the first identified, and those are slower, and they get their energy from waves leaking up from the photosphere. Type 2 spicules are faster. Uh, they are 1 to 2 minutes as opposed to 3 to 5 minutes uh, in, in duration. Uh, the energy source for these is still being discussed. But uh, some recent uh, advances show that they may be uh, they may be connected to magnetic reconnection. So the big questions that we talked about earlier: What the heck are those hairy features? Well, they're spicules, and spicules are small tubes of hot plasma. So we've at least answered one question. Now the next question: What exactly is going on in the chromosphere? Uh, going back to this slide, the chromosphere is the sun's lower atmosphere. It's between, it's above the photosphere and uh, below the transition region and corona. And this is where we see most of these features, or all of these features. Uh, one thing that we are using to probe the chromosphere and understand it better is uh, using different wavelengths of light to look at the sun. Uh, Different plasmas will uh, emit light or absorb light at very specific frequencies that are, um, that are unique and characteristic to that element. So if we look specifically at the, uh, the wavelength that that plasma is emitting or absorbing at, we can see what it's doing. And we can, we can uh, actually look at that plasma and separate it from other types of plasma that we're looking at. So, uh, also, this plasma um, emits at different wavelengths depending on how hot it is. So by looking at different wavelengths, we can also understand what, te what the temperatures are. Uh, so in a, in a spicule, in uh, its little magnetic flux tube, uh, we've got a mixed plasma that's got all sorts of different elements in it, but it's at different temperatures. So when it's cooler, usually down lower, it primarily emits and absorbs uh, H-alpha or hydrogen alpha wavelengths. But a spicule is usually heated over its lifetime. And as it's heated, it will fade out of emitting H-alpha and fade into emitting magnesium-2. And then if it's continued to be heated, it might fade out of magnesium-2 and fade into silicon-4. Uh, these are all names of wavelengths of light. So if we look at those specific wavelengths of light, we can see not only different points in a spicule's lifetime, but we can also see it in different locations. So earlier, it might be lower, farther down and to one side. And then later on, it might be higher up and uh, in a different location. And if we can look at multiple wavelengths of light, we can actually track its movement and its temperature changes. Now. Some of the more common wavelengths that we use to look at these include H alpha, hydrogen alpha, which uh, is actually a visible wavelength of light, uh, calcium two, which is also a visible wavelength of light, and magnesium two, which is a near UV wavelength. Uh, some other wavelengths that we use are Lyman alpha, which is an EUV wavelength, and silicon four, which is a far UV wavelength. Uh, as these go, they get hotter and hotter and shorter wavelength. So if a spicule is heated, it might go from H alpha to calcium two, to magnesium two, to Lyman alpha, to silicon four. It might not be heated all the way, so it might not actually shine in all those wavelengths. But 
if we see something, say in H alpha, and then we also look at it in silicon four and we don't see something, that tells us, hey, this spicule didn't heat that much and we've learned something. So each range of the emission happens at different times and locations in the spicule's lifetime. Uh, and a lot of the current, well, some of the current field of research is actually looking at what happens on the disk with different wavelengths and then mapping out what, where, and when things are happening. Uh, there's also been a lot of modeling efforts going on. Uh, I'm a little less familiar with some of the modeling, so forgive me if I'm missing anything major. Uh, currently, our efforts, uh, currently we have the ability to do uh, 2.5 dimension modeling. Uh, this is, uh, it's not quite three-dimensional modeling. Uh, it, it can be, but there are some very specific symmetry requirements, or symmetry assumptions that have to be made to say it's 3D modeling. So they call it 2.5D. Uh, scientists who are working on these models can reproduce spicule-like features in the models. And uh, we can also use our knowledge of what of the actual physical properties of what's going on in spicules to reproduce reasonable uh, spectral signatures uh, for what we think this should be producing and then compare it to what we actually measure. Uh, if you look at this image here, uh, on the top, we've got a um, we've got magnesium two recorded by a uh, satellite called Iris. Uh, on the bottom, we have uh, H alpha measurements, and in the center, that's actually been modeled. So this is this is part of the stage that we're currently at. So this is how we figure out what's been going on in the solar corona. Uh, sorry, not the corona, the chromosphere. Uh, and this is some of our research into what else will be happening there. So we figured uh, we, we're starting to look at what's going on in the corona, and we one of the main tools that we have is to look at the different wavelengths that emit in the corona in the chromosphere. Uh, and then finally, why is the so solar corona, which is its atmosphere, so hot? Uh, the solar corona is extremely hot. As I said before, it goes from 40,000 uh, degrees Fahrenheit to uh, 1,800,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, this is, when you convert this to Kelvin, uh, this is actually 45 times as hot in just a couple kilometers. So pretty crazy jump here. Uh, we know that a lot of the energy likely comes from something called mag magnetic reconnection where you have magnetic field lines, and when they crisscross, uh, they might actually connect with each other and then snap back like rubber bands. Uh, that rubber band snapping action is one of the things that can deposit the magnetic energy into the, uh, the atmosphere as either kinetic energy or heat energy. Uh, this is something that happens a lot with things like uh, solar flares. Uh, they are very explosive and also discrete. There's also wave action from below. Uh, we know that the, the lower sun is constantly boiling and it has all sorts of waves going through it, going throughout it. Uh, and most of those waves do tend to stay confined within the center, like within the lower regions of the sun. But we do know that uh, they do have some bleed through and some energy does bleed up into the atmosphere. Uh, those can be slightly larger, those can be slightly smaller, but they are continuous. Uh, there's always waves happening on the sun. So that is also another possible source of energy into the corona. Uh, finally, a third option might be hot matter that's moving upwards and carrying energy. If we've got something very hot that's moving upward, upwards very fast, it's going to deposit energy into the upper atmosphere. Uh, this isn't as common as it is down below. Uh, lower in the sun, it's kind of like boiling and turning over. And so that's one of the main methods of energy transport lower. But uh, it is possible that we can just get some really hot plasma and move it upwards and deposit energy up there. Uh, so can spicules uh, contribute to the energy in the corona. 
uh, they're definitely not the largest source of energy. They're definitely not the most, uh, like one of the most easiest or common sources of energy, but we, know, we do know that they contribute at least some energy. Uh, we do know that spicules are heated to transition region temperatures. Uh, the transition region is the, that really thin layer between the chromosphere and the corona. So we do know that they are heated enough that they can get up there. Uh, we also know that there are strong indications that spicules can actually connect to the transition region and actually deposit their mass and their energy into it. Uh, we don't know how many spicules connect to the transition region or how much energy or mass they might deposit. Uh, I've seen a paper that has a very, very, very rough estimate of maybe 25%, uh, but this is something that we definitely want to know more about. And this is something that, uh, this is something that uh, we're still definitely working on. Uh, so now we've got these big questions have been answered. Well, somewhat answered. Uh, we at least understand a bit more about them. So we know we've, we've figured out what are these features that are happening on the sun. Uh, they're spicules, they're tubes of plasma, and they've been observed since the 1800s. Uh, recently, they've been uh, observed in much more detail and we actually understand some of the physical processes that are behind them and that are causing them. Uh, we also know uh, a lot more about what actually is going on in the solar chromosphere. Uh, we can use uh, different wavelength observations to view what's happening. Uh, and we can then use those observations to constrain our models and be able to mathematically understand the sun much better. Uh, finally, why is the solar corona so hot? Uh, this is definitely an ongoing question. Uh, spicules are likely a small contribution, but uh, we are pretty sure that they do at least contribute some. Uh, this is something that I'm hoping to do a bit more research on in the future. Uh, so uh, something else that I wanted to cover was a little bit about my PhD research. Uh, since I am a fourth year PhD student, I'm hoping to graduate maybe sometime next year. Uh, and I think I've got one of the coolest second projects ever. So what we're working on is a, uh, it's a sounding rocket, which is a science rocket that's going to go up into above the atmosphere, and it's carrying an integral field spectrograph. Uh, this is a spectrograph that has, it basically creates a 3D data cube. Uh, we get two spectral dimensions and one spatial dimension. Uh, sorry, no, other way around. Two spatial dimensions and one spectral dimension. Uh, and not only do we get this information, we get it at a very high time cadence. Uh, this is, uh, we're hoping that this is going to be a, a very viable technology and will push the boundaries of what um, spectrographs are capable of today. So we're going to be launching next year, next spring in March, uh, from Poker Flat Research Range in Alaska. Uh, we're actually launching with two other rockets. Uh, High C Flare, run by Amy Weinberger, and Foxy 4, run by Lindsay Gleisner. Uh, this is the first time NASA has ever done a solar sounding rocket campaign where we've got all three rockets up at the, uh, up at the launch range at the same time, ready to launch. Uh, one, of our, uh, one of the reasons that we're actually going to be launching from Alaska is because we want to view, in addition to viewing spicules, we want to view a solar flare. And those don't happen all the time, and we don't have the ability to predict them ahead of time very accurately. So what we're going to do is we're actually, we have the, res, uh, the range reserved for two weeks, and we're going to sit there every day waiting for a solar flare to happen. And then once we see it happens, we're going to press the go button and go launch and see it, uh, which will be very stressful, but also very exciting. Uh, so this, uh, we're, we're hoping to launch next year in March 2024. Uh, and uh, this is going to be, assuming that this works, we're going to be able to prove that this technology is viable and I hope becomes one of the next steps in integral field spectrograph design. Uh, this image here is a image from the previous 
Foxy launch. Uh, they've all launched before, but this is going to be SNF's first time launching. Uh, oh, SNF's is the Solar Eruption Integral Field Spectrograph. If you'd like to know more about uh, some of the work I've been working on, uh, there is, I, I've included a link to a preprint pre -print paper that uh, we submitted in December, and we're hoping to have that finished up soon. Uh, it's called Spicules in Iris Magnesium II Observations, Automated Identification. Uh, and in this, we, uh, we analyze uh, magnesium II data, which is something we discussed earlier in the presentation. Uh, we're going to identify magnesium II data and actually identify where spicules are happening using only that data. Uh, previously, all spicule identification has depended somewhat on having uh, some of those visible wavelengths that we could see them in. Uh, but this one is going to be one of the first, this one is going to be the first time that we've identified it, identified thousands of spicules. Uh, no, hundreds of spicules in uh, just using magnesium too. And so this is a, a very exciting new tool so that we can now start comparing what's happening in visible, what's happening in magnesium too, what's happening in other wavelengths. And we can actually start tracking spicules along the, the lifetime, like what's their duration, what's their lifetime, what's their path, things like that. So uh, I wanted to thank you all for, um, for attending and being interested. Okay, thank you so much, Vicki. That was so um, interesting. I'm sure we have a lot of questions in the room. We have a, a few coming in online. Um, Terry is going to take the microphone around. If anyone has a question, just raise your hand. Um, we have one back there. Yes. Um, hi. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. That was very, very interesting. I have a question about your um, about sniffs. Actually, um, mm -hmm. you are you're hoping to l launch when a solar flare fires off. When you get up, will you be able to? Um, uh, will the time the rocket takes to actually get out of the atmosphere and get close to the sun be enough for um, to do the observations that you want to do in detail before the solar flare ends? That's one of the tricky questions that uh, the sounding uh, the 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 um, sounding rocket campaign group is actually trying to solve right now. Uh, while we don't think we'll be able to have like actual prediction, like automatic prediction capabilities at that point, we are hoping to at least be able to analyze what's happening at the very very beginning part of the flare. And use that pr to predict things like how big of a flare is it going to be? How long is it going to last? Uh, things, things like that. Uh, we don't expect to, I don't think we expect to actually be able to see the peak part of the flare, but we do expect to see a lot of the gradual like declining phase. Uh, now there is a chance that it could be a small flare or a very, very short flare, which would be bad. Uh, it's going to take us, 10 to 15 minutes, hopefully 10, less than 10 minutes to actually get up there. Uh, but that's still something that we're figuring out. So there is a small chance that we would miss it, but we're, um, most flares are much longer on the orders of like tens of minutes to hour or something. Perfect, thank you. Okay, we have one um, from uh, Jay Jarnigan online. He asks, how was Seki able to observe the sun without blinding himself since video technology wasn't available at that time? I am not sure. I, I could give some good guesses, uh, but people in the room, He used a spectrograph and was so he was only looking very specifically H alpha light. He isolated that uh, with a series of prisms so he could just pick out a very narrow part of the spectrum and actually see the H alpha uh, at the limb. And he could only see it at the limb because there was still light from the disk, so he could only look at the 
at the limb and see clearly the, the spicules. Yeah, so I was curious about the launches too. Do these um, kind of, I'm gonna guess, you tell me I'm wrong, uh, go like straight up, like above the atmosphere, take observations and then come back down? Mm -hmm. um, how long How long do they get to observe? About I five guess. minutes, oh, okay. uh, depending on our weight. So if we, if we wait a little bit less, then we'll get a little bit more than five minutes. But we are expecting at least five minutes above the atmosphere. Um, and we, we don't launch completely straight up because we don't want it to fall back down on us. So we do launch out at an angle, and then we'll have to go retrieve the rocket afterwards. Okay, we have another question from the chat. Do the spicules show relativistic effects? Uh, I don't believe so. Uh, these are moving on the orders of like, 10 to 50 kilometers a second, uh, which isn't anywhere near um, near relativistic speeds. Um, so are the lifetimes of the high energy and lower energy spicules different? Do you actually have an order of magnitude for their different lifetimes? Yeah, the high energy ones tend to be one to two minutes long. Uh, whereas the lower energy ones tend to be three to five minutes long. And a follow up to that, any guess why? I am not the best person to ask that, but uh, if anyone else in the room knows, then go ahead. Okay, we'll ask one more question uh, from the chat. Are the interior regions of the sun as inhomogeneous as the outer regions that we can observe? Uh, let's go back to this diagram. So uh, the sun definitely has a lot of different, uh, a, a number of different layers. Uh, as you get closer to the outside of the sun, you can definitely see different things. Uh, the, the inside of the sun is, I'm not actually sure on the best answer on this one. Uh, when we're looking at different, uh, different elements in the sun, it's still mostly hydrogen. Uh, it's like 95% hydrogen, 3% uh, helium, maybe, 4% helium and one or 2% everything else. So when we're looking at these elements, they are definitely in the minority there. Uh, that's actually one of the reasons that uh, out, uh, hydrogen lines are so very bright is because there's just so much hydrogen up there. Uh, when you get to the very outer edges of, uh, of the sun's atmosphere and, and some of the temperature minimum stuff, you can get uh, molecules that are actually cool enough that they can actually be molecules, not just um, not just pure elements. So in cooler cooler regions, uh, you see this especially in smaller stars. Uh, you can actually get molecules that are connected together, and they have very different lines and very different behaviors than pure ionized atoms. I have a question about Poker Flat. It's, this is the first solar sounding rocket mission I've ever heard of going out of Poker Flat. It's is it because you have three rockets at once and they can't do three at White Sands where they typically launch solar or what, what's the story there? So the reason is we wanna sit on the launch pad for two weeks and there's no way White Sands is gonna let us reserve the launch pad for two whole weeks. Uh, usually you get about an hour. And then if you don't make, if you don't hit your launch window, they boot you off and make you buy a new slot. Are there any more questions in the room? Uh, so, hi. so my question is like, so basically you have a certain altitude from where you are measuring this. Like mm -hmm. what is that range? And why, why we are going with like sounding rocket? Because you mentioned that there's so much risk there because you, you just got a little bit of window and 
uh, there's a lot of uncertainties in rocketry. So why we are not like just uh, sending out a probe using an orbital thing and like just measuring and taking the data? Like, is it a, like just because of economics or like, I just wanted mm -hmm. to know that. Yeah, so it is it is an economics question uh, in part. Uh, the more money you spend on something, the, uh, the more money NASA spends on something, the more risk averse they're going to be. Uh, that's why the James Webb Telescope, they tested every single possible thing about that uh, very, very, very thoroughly because they don't want to spend billions of dollars and have it not work. Uh, with something like a sounding rocket, uh, that is, uh, I think, uh, about the budget for a sounding rocket might be like a million to five million dollars ish. Uh, that is, it's it's a lot of money, but it's so much less than other large uh, large missions. So because sounding rockets are small budget wise, uh, they can fund a lot of them, and it's okay if they're risky. Uh, they can take those risks, and often when when you're taking risks, the reason you're taking risks is with great risk you get you might get great reward. Uh, so they like to find things that yeah, there's some risk in here, but this is a really cool thing that we need to advance that we need to test out. The reason we are doing a sounding rocket instead of a satellite is. Partially, it is it is cheaper, uh, and with the our uh, our primary mirror is actually uh, ten inches in diameter. Uh, it would be a pretty su substantial mission to try and send a satellite up with a ten inch mirror. That's not just that's not a CubeSat mission. Uh, that's a decent sized small satellite. Uh, and with this technology, we are this is partially proof of concept work. Uh, this has never been proven in an actual flight mission. So far, it's only been proven on an optical bench. Uh, so part of it, again, is that risk. Uh, we don't want to send up a satellite that we're like, yes, this will run for six months, and then it doesn't work. Uh, like, we're going to learn things, but we benefit more from that repeatability of send up a rocket, get five minutes of data, come back down, uh, make some adjustments, fix the mistakes that we made before, uh, update with the new things that we've learned and then send it up again and try and, and update and improve the technology. And then once we are confident that yes, this works and yes, this is worth spending a satellite's amount of money on, then we can put it on a satellite and have long duration, uh, long duration observations. So, so altitude part, like what's your required altitude in this? Like when you're measuring this? Yeah. Uh, I believe we're going to turn on our um, turn on our uh, detectors at uh, above 200 kilometers. Uh, we're expecting to, I think we're hoping to get about 300, uh, maybe 350 kilometers if we're doing good. Uh, but we're going to start uh, observing after 200 kilometers. Uh, and the reason is the atmosphere doesn't have a top. It just gets less and less and less and less dense. So the higher we get up, the better our view is going to be. But if we're observing earlier, we're just going to have not as good um, viewing. Got it. Thanks. Hi. So are there regions of the sun devoid of spicules, or is it, are they just occurring everywhere? They, so they are fairly ubiquitous on the sun. Uh, they do not tend to occur in sunspots or in active regions. Uh, if anyone's unfamiliar with sunspots or active regions, uh, these are features on the sun. If you look in um, an active region is a region on the sun where the sun's magnetic field is actually popping out of the sun's surface in a big loop. And the two points where it pops in and out uh, those are the foot points, and those tend to be very strongly magnetic. Uh, they tend to have all sorts of stuff going on uh, and can be fairly chaotic magnetically around them. Uh, this can cause them to emit a lot in, um, in stronger, uh, in shorter wavelengths and, and higher energy wavelengths. Uh, 
Uh, it also traps the, the plasma that's in them. It actually traps and starts cooling off like within the actual magnetic loop. And so that is invisible light. That's a sunspot. It looks darker than the rest of everything else because the plasma inside that loop is actually cooled, uh, cooled off. So we don't see spicules inside active regions. Uh, those tend to be dominated by the bigger loops. We do see spicules a lot on the edges of active regions. Uh, and then we also see them in the uh, in coronal holes, in the quiet sun, uh, most other places on the sun. We have a few more questions coming in from uh, online. Um, this one asks, can you view the spicules with an amateur telescope using a solar filter and a digital lens? What about solar flares? For, for spicules, uh, it depends on how big your telescope is, I suppose. Uh, I've got a 10 inch telescope at home. There's no way I could get enough resolution to actually see that. If you've got like an entire house or barn built around a telescope, uh, yeah, maybe you could see them. Uh, it really just depends on how big of a mirror you're willing to spend money on. Uh, as for solar flares, uh, I don't think solar flares most uh, spend most of their energy in X-ray and ultraviolet uh, wavelengths. So I'm I don't know that you can actually see anything visible by eye. Okay, we have another one. Um... What special aspect of spicules help in tracking solar storms? I guess, or do they help in tracking solar storms? Yeah. Uh, solar spicules tend to be fairly uncorrelated with solar storms. Uh, solar storms generally tend to happen because of large uh, magnetic events, um, either solar flares or coronal mass ejections. Uh, these, most of, uh, these tend to happen when you have a great big loop of magnetic structure. Uh, it crosses over itself, crosses the streams, they connect, and they rubber band a huge amount of energy out, and they rubber band, band a huge amount of energy back down. Uh, if that, um, for a flare, that, uh, that comes out as a form of light and can be seen all over, the photons go every direction. Uh, if it happens to be a uh, coronal mass ejection, that's more like a cannonball. Uh, you have a giant bubble of plasma that's shot out from the sun somewhere. And if the Earth happens to be in the way, uh, that can cause a pretty bad solar storm. But spicules are not generally involved in those kind of events. Um, somebody else asks, do we know anything about what spicules could be like on other stars? Would differences in star mass, composition, et cetera, cause any changes? I have no clue on this one. <laughs> I do, I can say with certainty that uh, spicules are very likely too small for us to be able to see on other stars uh, with any, un unless we get like, I don't know, faster than light travel or weird black hole or wormhole or who knows something like that. Like, unless we get some pretty crazy new technologies. Uh, I'm pretty sure we won't be able to see spicules on other stars. So the best way to answer that would be modeling. Just a few more. Has the Parker Solar Probe helped with your research? Uh, I have not personally used Parker Solar Probe data, but uh, our flare campaign is actually going to be co-observing with the Parker Solar Probe. Uh, so one of the reasons that we are launching in uh, late May is the Parker Solar Probe is actually going to be on this side of the sun and going to be observing the same locations that we're looking at. So we're actually going to be able to look at the exact same regions at the exact same time, both record data, and then compare notes afterwards.
a general question. Is there a specific reason that the transition region changes temperature so quickly? I'm sure there is. Uh, I am not the expert in that. Uh, and I imagine, like, I don't know the, uh, the answer. I don't know if that has been completely answered yet. So that would be something I'd definitely want to look up and look into. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Yeah, the reason we don't put it on a CubeSat is in its current form, it is too big and too risky. Uh, it's a lot easier to develop this technology with short-term rocket launches rather than a long-term uh, a long term observation on a satellite. A point of historical clarification. I think you said that Father Secchi was the first person to do daily observations of the sun. And in fact, there was there was quite a history of daily observations before Father Secchi, not to take away from the great Father Secchi, who did many fantastic things. But for instance, Heinrich Schwabe in 1826 started observing sunspots because he was looking for the planet Vulcan inside of Mercury's orbit. And he kept the, these pesky sunspots kept getting in the way. So he started observing the sun every single day, as, at least as often as he could from cloudy Germany, right? But for 17 years, he observed sunspots and actually discovered the solar cycle by doing so. And so he was one of the earliest ones to make it a daily uh, endeavor. Oh, thank in, in you. Observing. That's good to know. And then uh, Richard Carrington, of course, in England, was also doing daily observations of sunspots. And he was the first one to see a flare using a visible light telescope in projection. So. To, to the earlier question, yes, you can see flares in white light or visible light through an amateur telescope even, but it's quite rare. It, it takes right. the, some of the largest flares that we know of before you get a significant white light signal. So it, it, it's, and it started with Galileo, of course, in 1610. I don't know if he was a daily observer, but uh, he, he did regularly observe for quite a while. Yeah, so. Thanks for all that information. Sure. And by the way, he never found planet Vulcan. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody has yet. It's it could still be there. Still hiding. Yeah. Okay, here we have another one. Is there a clear or direct impact that the spicules have on our atmosphere? Uh definitely not. Okay. <laughs> uh they are they are very small and they have so many layers of the rest of the sun to go to. Uh the most that they'll do is deposit their energy in the transition region which eventually gets out of the sun. What might uh, SNFs V2 look like? Sorry, what was that? What might uh, SNFs V2 look like, the next, the next version? Mm -hmm. Not sure yet because we don't know how well SNFs V1 works. Uh, we'd love to eventually be able to put this on a satellite, uh, especially a large satellite. Like I think this can be one of the next, like the next big step in uh, integral field spectrogra spectrographs. So uh, that that would be uh, spectrographs that can take two spatial dimensions and one uh, spectral dimension. And one of the reasons that SNFs is so big in this is current spectrograph technology, um, it takes time to take that picture. Uh, if you want to get two spatial dimensions and one spectral dimension, it can take, I don't know, a minute or two to actually get all that information because at the moment, uh, for example, the IRIS satellite, which is the one I'm getting most of my data from uh, for, for my paper that I just uh, sent in, uh, it can take a spectrum, uh, it can take its spectral measurements, but it can only, it's a slit spectrograph. So it takes a vertical slit, it spreads that light out into a spectrum, it records the data, and then it scoots over to the next spot, uh, 
records that data and then scoots over to the next spot and records that data. So if you want, you've got your, your spectral dimension and you've got one spatial dimension, but if you want to build that second spectral, uh, second spatial dimension up, you actually have to go one pixel by pixel by pixel horizontally across your image. Uh, that can take seven to 10 seconds on, I think, Iris's fastest setting. So it can take several minutes to get across a medium-sized picture. Uh, with SNFs, we can get this on, well, we hope we can get this on a one-second time cadence. Uh, and that's particularly important because things like solar flares and things like spicules change on the order of a handful of seconds. Uh, if you take a picture and then you come back and you take a picture 10 minutes later, it's going to look completely different. So we're hoping that once we prove this technology, uh, eventually we can turn this into the next generation of spectrograph. Thank you. Okay, we have another one online. Are there any other future missions or observations aimed at studying solar spicules other than SNPs? Uh, yeah, so currently a lot of, um, a number of different telescopes are actually studying them. Uh, there is the Swedish Solar Telescope in Las Palmas, I think, in La Palma, in La Palma. Uh, and that looks at uh, hydrogen alpha, um, hydrogen alpha wavelength. And that is one of the most commonly, um, one of the most commonly that I've seen used wavelengths to actually study spicules. Uh, they also have the ability to look in calcium-2, which is another visible wavelength. Um, the IRIS satellite has a huge log of information um, looking at spicules, both on the limb, well, primary, primarily on the limb, but uh, they also happen to be on the disk. And so that's what I've been researching is how do we identify them on the disk? Uh, so those satellites have a very long history, or that satellite and that telescope have a very long history of observing spicules. Uh, I believe there's another one. Um, I know there's another uh, telescope called Big Bear Solar Observatory. Uh, I haven't looked into their observations, but I would assume that they've also uh, looked at spicules in H-alpha. Uh, there are a number of other wavelengths, um, number of other uh, satellites, which I believe have also been looking at them as well, uh, but I'm not, those are the ones I'm most familiar with. There are just uh, four questions left online. Two are about the physical characteristics mm -hmm. of spicules and two are about their importance. I think we can combine these. <laughs> um, one says, are there any radio emissions specifically from spicules? Not that I know of. Okay. And um, somebody else wanted to know, uh, they said, you mentioned that one foot of the spicules is in the photosphere and the second foot is somewhere else. Is there any consistent pattern in where the second foot lands or is it mostly random? That's something that we are still learning about. Uh, so if you see this image here, uh, some of the uh, some of the, the spicules are shown to go straight up, and those might connect with the um, higher up in the transition region. Uh, most of them arc over and then um, have a second foot point somewhere else uh, in the photosphere or the the lower chromosphere. So most of them probably are just a, a small arcing tube that connects back at the same height. Some of them may actually go all the way up and connect to hotter or higher transition region um, structures, but we don't know proportions of these. We don't know the statistics on this. Uh, the best estimate is maybe 25% might actually connect up higher, but we don't know that. Okay, thank you. Um, and the last question. Um, why is it so important to study solar spicules and how can the study of solar spicules contribute to our understanding of the broader universe? The big picture. <laughs> All right, big picture. Uh, one of the things I would say like, is the sun is very, very hard to understand. 
And the sun as our closest star is our best opportunity to study a star. Uh, if we, we don't know how our sun, well, there's a lot of ways that our sun may be similar to other stars. There's a lot of ways that our sun may be different. But if we can understand the basic physics of how our sun works, and if we can model it, and if we can predict it, uh, at that point, we've got a pretty good understanding of how the physics of how stars might work. Uh, we definitely want to compare it to all other stars and confirm that if we if we simulate another star and we can predict what's going on in that star and our observations confirm that, hey, this is what we're expecting. If we can get to that point, that lets us model so many things and learn so many things from those models that we may never be able to observe specifically. So it it really helps us understand a much better it gives us a better understanding of the fundamental forces of the universe and the fundamental structures of the universe. Thank you very much. That is indeed the big picture. <laughs> mm -hmm. Let's all uh, give Vicki a round of applause.